So you guys remember how the whole world went into lockdown for a while a few years ago, and some places might still be locked down to a degree, but as a result of those lockdowns and people having to work remotely in order to keep the businesses businessing, video calling software ended up becoming a staple application for so many people's workflows, even replacing Office 365 as the most essential program in some places. Software like Zoom, which was fairly obscure before lockdowns, all of a sudden became an app that almost everyone with a computer has used at some point. But one of the dangers that we run into when a piece of software goes from obscure to almost ubiquitous is that the program could be exploited to do some harm on a very large scale to the people that are using it. And not just exploited in the sense of a criminal hacking it in order to get into your computer, but the company behind the software could exploit your reliance on it to do direct harm to you as well. And I think both of these kinds of exploits are much more common with proprietary software. Now today, we're gonna to take a look at a case where video conferencing software that more than 10,000 courtrooms around the world today rely on was backdoored in a supply chain attack. So the software that got hacked here is called Justice AV Solutions, or JABS for short. And like I said, it's used in courtrooms all around the world. And you can only imagine the kind of damage that could be caused by sensitive data from the courts falling into the wrong hands. Like in organized crime cases, for example, it's not unusual at all for the identities and the whereabouts of witnesses or law enforcement to be concealed because of fears that they might get killed by a member of that gang or cartel or whatever. A compromise of court systems could also easily lead to things like a mistrial which might ultimately lead to a criminal being found not guilty. The hacker controlling the software could literally determine people's fate. I mean, imagine them offering something like mistrials as a service on a darknet market somewhere. It's really not that far-fetched. Now, the disclosure of this vulnerability, this backdoor, the supply chain attack, is fairly new. Uh, the only information that I found about it from the vendors directly is this post on their downloads page mentioning the specific version that was affected, and we also have the CVE number here, um, and a recommendation to download their software from support.jabs.com instead of, I guess, this page, which would be the uh, usual link. Uh, but funny thing about support.jabs.com, it seems to be timing out and also it seems to not be responding to pings right now. Um, but you know, in lieu of that, we do have a little bit of uh, technical information about this supply chain attack from Rapid7. And I'm gonna leave a link to this full write-up in the video's description if you're interested in reading it, but just some of the interesting details here. The backdoored version of this software was signed with a certificate from Vanguard Tech Limited instead of the usual certificate, which would have been Justice AV Solutions Incorporated. So that's one way that this might have been caught a little bit earlier by a, a diligent security analyst. You can kind of see the timeline for exploitation here, um, February 10th when that uh, certificate was used and then um, all the way until recently that it's been disclosed and um, the uh, vendor has removed the backdoored version that was being served from their website. Now, when you downloaded this backdoored version of the Jabs Viewer software, it would contain a malicious binary that's called 
ffmpeg.exe, notice the three Fs instead of two, which would handle the connections to the hacker's command and control servers, basically giving them a backdoor into the system that had been infected. Um, and that malicious binary would also execute obfuscated PowerShell scripts that would attempt to bypass anti-malware tools and disable event tracing for Windows in order to try and cover up traces of the malware before executing additional payloads. Uh, and there were also other malicious payloads that were being deployed from the CNC servers um, with names like Chrome underscore installer.exe, Firefox underscore updater.exe, and OneDrive standalone updater.exe. Uh, and some of these payloads had additional functionalities like the ability to deploy Python scripts. Now, if I had to guess, the hackers probably named their original backdoor FFFmpeg.exe in order to try and blend in, right? It's kind of like typo squatting that we see with uh, URLs and stuff like that. You know, if the victim is using video conferencing software, they're probably using FFmpeg as a dependency. It's pretty common dependency on a lot of systems. Uh, and so if they don't notice that one extra F, then they might not get suspicious about seeing FFFmpeg in Task Manager. And at the same time, this binary, um, FFFmpeg, because it has that extra F, isn't going to interfere with legitimate calls to FFmpeg. Um, you know, it's gonna have a different path variable. So the, um, recommendation if you've been infected by this backdoor uh, in Jav's viewer 8.3.7 is to re-image the system that you had it on and also reset any credentials that are being used on that system. And there's also a list of indicators of compromise here on Rapid7's write-up. So you can hopefully use that if you're responsible for uh, systems that are running this software to um, see if they've been infected. Now, as I said before, this kind of abuse and malevolence with software, at least in my opinion, is more common with proprietary software, which I believe the Jabs viewer is. Um, obviously, it relies on some open source software like FFmpeg, but I haven't been able to get source code for the entire application myself, and hell, I can't even download a binary for it right now. Um, and of course, open source software is not completely immune or invulnerable to these types of supply chain attacks. I mean, we saw what happened with the XZ backdoor, but my thoughts about this kind of go beyond just the security principle, because there's something that seems deeply wrong about courts and other public systems relying on software that's ultimately controlled by corporations like this. Because, you know, if it's not open source, if it's not free software and you don't control it, then somebody else does, right? The proprietor. And, you know, at this point, you could argue that this company is being given unjust power over the courts. Like all of those hypothetical scenarios that I was talking about earlier that a hacker could pull, the company could just as easily pull. And of course, without going to the extremes, if something like software licenses or any other kind of profit-driven DRM is implemented into this proprietary software, as it oftentimes is implemented into proprietary software, then the courts are gonna be paying for that with taxpayer money. Proprietary software is already a kind of evil by itself, but outsourcing the burden of satisfying the greed of the software's proprietor to the taxpayer elevates it to a much higher and just totally unnecessary evil. That's why I really want to see the government systems here in America and elsewhere start doing what this German state is doing, where they migrated 30,000 of their workers to Linux PCs instead of continuing with Windows. Imagine the savings to the people with doing something like this. First off, the savings with not having to buy license keys for Windows. Like, I'm sure that the government gets a bulk discount, but 
you can't get any cheaper than no license fee at all. And furthermore, imagine the savings in bandwidth with not having to load Microsoft spyware every time you turn on your computer and the savings in computer hardware. This is tangentially related, but yesterday I was providing remote support for my sister's computer that was very slow. She had hardly any applications on it, and granted, the specs of it weren't great. It was a one-core, two-thread Celeron processor clocked at about 1.1 gigahertz with four gigs of RAM. Now, even though that's not you know, a big beastly, like, gaming rig. She's not a gamer, you know, she's not doing anything crazy. She just does light web browsing and a little bit of word processing, like, editing her resume. But her computer's performance was abysmal because she had Windows 11 on it. And before Windows 11 will even begin to let you do anything looking like legitimate work, they have to load all of their ads and corporate slash government spyware in the background, just stressing out that poor little Celeron processor that was doing his best. So I'm really hoping that when I see her in July, I can install a JustWorks Linux distro to her PC to save her from the privacy violating, e-waste creating extension of the alphabet agencies that Windows has become. And I hope more people wake up to this, not just with Windows, but with all proprietary software and stop forcing us to pay for the abuse that these companies are doing, both to us indirectly and to our governments directly.